Right, in this video, we're going to talk about section 7.5 dealing with uh, real numbers. And in this uh, section, we're going to talk about recognizing and defining real numbers, performing operations on real numbers, calculating the nth root, and in particular, the square root. Then define a raised to the one over n and a raised to the m over n and examine why they are defined in this way and simplify expressions involving radicals and radical exponents. All right, so let's look at what real numbers are. Every rational number can be expressed as either a terminating decimal or a repeating decimal. And it was the ancient Greeks who discovered numbers that are non-terminating and non-repeating decimals. Such numbers in this case are called irrational numbers. Now, if you recall, we did talk about uh, pretty much terminating decimals and repeating decimals. Terminating decimals were covered, was covered in section uh, 7.1. Repeating decimals was covered in section 7.2. Okay, so now let's look at, in this case, irrational numbers. Here's some characteristics. There must be an infinite number of non-zero digits to the right of the decimal point, and there cannot be a repeating block of digits. Okay, so irrational numbers are considered to be non-terminating and non-repeating decimals. And we're going to look into more into that in this video. All right, next we'll look at square roots. Let's talk about that one. Irrational numbers occur in the study of area. Here, the area of a square is calculated by using the formula A is equal to S square. So here's a square right there, four equal sides. When you find the area, you take the square of the length of that side. So if S is equal to, in this, let's say 11, then that means that the area would be the square of 11 or 11 times 11, which is 121. Now, conversely, if we know the area, if we know that whatever this space is, we can calculate the length of the side of the square. So on the next page, you'll see this. Let's say the area of the square is 49. That's this green area here, that's 49. The length of a side will have to be this. A is equal to S squared, which will be equal to 49. So that means S will have to be seven or negative seven. Now, because lengths are always non-negative, the only possible solution for that would be seven. So you have to think of what number squared will give you seven. And it has to be positive because uh, lengths are never gonna be negative. All right, so now let's look at uh, the definition of square root. A square root of a non-negative number A is a number X such that X squared gives you A. So like when we have the S, S squared is equal to 49, we have to think of what number squared gives us 49. Has to be seven. And it also can be negative seven, okay? Now, the principal square root is this. If A is any non-negative number, the principal square root of A, which is gonna be denoted by this symbol, which is the radical sign and then the A, and it's understood to be the square root of A, is the non-negative number X, such that X squared gives us A. So we're only looking for the non-negative number when we're dealing with the principal square root. Here's some examples. Let's say I have the square root, find the following, the square roots of 144. So I want to find out what uh, numbers squared would give me 144. And in this case, I know that 
12 times 12, 12 squared gives me 144. I also know the negative of that, negative 12. If you square negative 12, you're gonna also get 144. But let's say I just want the uh, principal square root of 144. So here I'm looking for the non-negative number so that I would get 144 when I square it. It has to be only positive 12. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's because 12 squared is 12 times 12, which is 144. The principal square root, I just focus on the non-negative number by definition. And part C, the square root of four ninths. Okay. Now the square root of four ninths. I take the square root of four, I have to find out what number squared would give me four ninths. Now I can look at the numerator and the denominator to find out uh, what number squared would give me the numerator and what number squared would give me the denominator. Only the two, if I squared, would give me four. And only the three, if I square that, that would give me nine. So the square root of four ninths would be two fourths. I mean, two thirds, two thirds. Okay. All right, let's take a look at this homework example, similar to what's in my math lab. And in this case here, I want to find the following, the principal square root of 576. Okay, and what I have here is a uh, chart that looks like this. This will also be on Canvas. So when you deal with, uh, we'll be using that uh, a little bit later, but uh, also, you might need to use the calculator here for the square root of 576, because you might not know that off the top of your head. All right, so for the square root of 576, now I'm using a TI-83. Uh, I'm not sure what your calculator looks like with square roots, so you might have to enter that a little bit differently. So I know I'd have to do second and X squared for the square root, as X squared as above it, the square root, so I do second, x squared, and then 576. That would give me 24. So the principal square root of 576 will be 24. And then part B, the square root of 169, okay? The square root of 169, of course, if you want to use this table, that's fine. Look under n square, find the number 169, and look to the left. That will give you the square root of 169, which is in this case 13. And then part C, negative square root of 36. Well, we know it's going to be negative. And then what number squared would give you 36? It will have to be six. So negative square root of 36 will be negative six. All right, part D, the square root of 400. Okay, so we have to think of what number squared would give us 400. So we look under the n squared column on this table and find 400. I took this all the way up to 20. 400, look to the left, you'll see it's 20. So that means that the square root of 400 is 20. Now for the square root of one over 16. Well, let's think about this. What number squared will give you one? Will be one. And what number times itself will give you 16? Or what number squared will give you 16? It will be four. So the square root of 1 16th will be 1 fourth. Now for the square root of 0. 0.0004, uh, 
probably going to need to use a calculator for this one. Now I'm doing second x squared on my calculator. Yours may be different. And then type in 0 0.0004, be 0 0.02. Okay. So that's how we find square roots here. Okay. Now keep in mind that uh, your calculator is different, maybe different from mine. So make sure that you're familiar with what your calculator does and how, how it computes the square root of numbers. All right, let's look at other roots. This is on the next page. The nth root of x is denoted by this notation. The n is gonna be the index of this radical and then your x is gonna be underneath the radical. That's how we denote the nth root of x. If n is even and x is positive, then the principal nth root of x is gonna be positive. That means that this index here has to be even, x has to be positive, okay? Now, if n is even, if that index n is even and x is negative, then the nth root of x is not gonna be a real number. So let's take, for example, the square root of negative four. That's not gonna give you a real number because we can't take the square root of a negative number. Now, if n is odd and x is negative, then the nth root of x will be negative. Good example of that would be the cube root of, let's say negative eight. That we can take the cube root of because we can think of what number times itself would give us negative eight. And in this case, it's going to be negative two, because you have to think of this negative two, and you cube that, you will get negative eight. So n, which is your index is odd, x underneath the radical is negative, then of course, the nth root of x will be negative. Now, because the square root of a exists, if it exists, because the square root of a, if it exists, is non-negative by definition, the square root of negative three and u squared is this. If you square negative three, you'll get positive nine. The square root of nine is three. So in general, the square root of a squared is equal to the absolute value of a. Okay, because a could be positive or negative. So that's why we use absolute value of A. All right, now let's talk about the irrationality of square roots and other roots. Now, some square roots, as we've seen, are rational numbers, and others, like the square root of two, are irrational numbers. If you were to use a calculator, you can determine whether a square root is irrational, since irrational numbers are considered to be non-repeating, non-terminating decimals, okay? Now, if you did this in the calculator for the square root of two, this would be the decimal value for it. And as you can see, we have a string of non-terminating, non-repeating decimals. We ended up with a non-terminating, non-repeating decimal. That means that the square root of two is irrational. All right, now let's look at the systems of the system of real numbers. The set of real numbers, which is gonna be capital letter R, that's gonna be the union of the set of rational numbers and the set of irrational numbers. The decimal form of any real number is either gonna be terminating, repeating, or non-repeating. Each, if every integer is a rational number as well as a real number, and every rational number is a real number, but not every real number is rational. Okay. Like the square root of two. The square root of two is a real number, but it's not rational. It's irrational. 
Okay, so here's what the uh, here's what this illustration looks like. You got real numbers. The set of all x such that x is a decimal. It's either going to be irrational, which is going to be the set of non-terminating, non-repeating decimals, or it's going to be rational, where it is either a repeating decimal or a terminating decimal. And from rational numbers, we have integers, which are positive and negative numbers and zero, whole numbers, which starts at zero, natural numbers, which starts at one. Okay, so now on the next page is a couple of examples where we're going to determine which, which of the following, if any, represent irrational numbers. And it's probably best to use a calculator to find out whether they're rational or irrational, like the square root of 42. Like second x squared, I'm doing this on my TI-84 plus. Square root of 42 knows you have a string of non-repeating, non-terminating numbers. This is a non-terminating, non-repeating decimal here, as you can see. So this would be irrational. Okay, and the square root of 36. Well, if you do the square root of 36 in the calculator, you're going to find out that it's going to end up being 6, because I know 6 times 6 gives me 36. Okay. So actually, this is a rational number. And the square root of 324. Let's uh, do second. This dude square root of 324. You're going to end up getting 18. And 18 is a rational number, by the way. And then the square root of 75, square root of 75. If we do that, you're going to find you're going to get a non-terminating, non-repeating decimal here. So the square root of 75 is irrational. And uh, two minus five square root of five. All right, let's see about this one right here, two minus five square root of five. Now here I get a non-terminating, non-repeating decimal, as you can see here. So that is irrational. And square root of five divided by two. Square root of five divided by two. Again, I get a non-repeating, non non-terminating decimal. So this is also irrational. Okay. Now, I'm not sure in the home of how they want that, but uh, pretty much I think you'll just have to select which ones are rational and which ones are irrational. Okay. Yeah, you pretty much have to select which ones are rational and which ones are irrational in the uh, homework. Okay. All right. Let's look at this next homework example. Let's say we want to determine if a given number belongs to this set, to each of the uh, sets that are given. Here we got 
Okay. So here we have to be familiar with this to identify which ones that uh, 5.284 belongs to. Now, and here you just have to answer yes or no. So in this case, if a natural number is with 5.284, be a irrational number, I mean, a rational number. And the answer for that one would be no. Because natural numbers consist of just one, two, three, four, five. There are no decimals in, it, in them. So that answer would be no. Would it be the set of whole numbers? Again, that answer is also no. Whole numbers start with zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. There are no decimals there. What about the set of integers? That's also a no. The reason for that is this. Integers are whole numbers that consist of just positive and negative numbers and zero. There are no decimals in those integers. Now, what about a rational number? In this case, it is because it is a terminating decimal. Rational numbers consist of either a repeating decimal or a terminating decimal. And in this case, 5.284 is a terminating decimal. So that's yes. Now, if it's a rational number, it's not going to be able to be at an irrational number. So this has to be no for irrational numbers. There is no number in the set of real numbers that's both rational and irrational. It's either one or the other. And of course, all rational numbers are considered to be real numbers. So that's a yes. Okay. All right, next we'll look at some of the properties of uh, real numbers. Properties of real numbers, that's this right here. And I think there's a few more on the next page in your handout. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division are defined on the set of real numbers in such a way that all the properties of these operations on rational still hold. The properties are summarized right here. Starting with the closure property, of course, if you have real numbers A and B, A plus B and A times B are considered to be unique real numbers. Okay, you're going to get unique real numbers for the sum and the product of A and B. For the commutative property, for addition and multiplication, they both are the same. I can add A and B together, I get the same sum as if I added B and A together. And also A times B is the same as B times A. Then the associative property, here the grouping does not change the answer. I can group B and C and then add A. That's the same as adding A and B together first and then add C to it. Multiplication, the same way. Add B and multiply B and C first and then add A to it. And then multiply A and B first and then multiply that product by C. It's the same thing. Identity properties. The number zero is the unique identity, additive identity. And the number one would be the unique multiplicative identity. So that means zero plus any number is that number. And then for the one, one times any number will be that same number. Okay. All right, on the next page, you'll see the inverse properties. Negative A will be the unique additive inverse, where if I take a number, add its opposite or additive inverse, I'm going to get zero. And then for the multiplicative inverse, that's the same as the reciprocal. A times its multiplicative inverse, which is one over A, that'll be one. And of course, keep in mind the multiplicative inverse is another way of saying the reciprocal. Okay. And we did talk about the reciprocal back in chapter six. 
All right, now the distributed property multiplication over addition and subtraction. These are all the same for real numbers that we talked about for whole numbers here. A times the quantity B plus C, we just distribute the A over the B and the C by multiplying. And also the same holds true for A times the quantity B minus C. We uh, distribute the A over the B minus C by multiplying to get this. The multiplication property of zero is this. Zero multiplied by any real number is zero. And the denseness property is if you have real numbers A and B, then there is a number called C where C is greater than A, but less than B. So if you give me any two real numbers, let's say five and six, I can find a real number that is greater than five and less than six. And there are infinitely many of them. All right, next we'll talk about ordering real numbers. To order real numbers, we consider where the decimal form of the real number might lie on a number line, or we compare them using place value as we ordered decimals. So in this example here, let's take a look at that example. Let's say I want to arrange the following real numbers in order from greatest to least. I'm gonna put these in order from greatest to least. So let's start with the point eight. And what I wanna do here is put this, I wanna write this using let's say eight decimal places, let's say point eight with seven zeros behind it. And then point eight, the eight repeats. So I'm gonna write eight, eight times. And then point eight three, where only the three repeats. So I have the eight and then I'm gonna write two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then point eight, eight, three, only the eight and the three repeats. Let's see, 0 0.8, and then 8383, 8, 8, 8, and I know there's going to be a 3 behind it, but I'm just carrying this out to eight decimal places. Point 0.8, the next one's point, oh, point 0.383. And then So zero point, and of course the three and the eight and the three repeats will be point three, eight, three, three, eight, three, three, eight, three, and nine. And that'll, that'll be as far as I'll go with that. Now for the square root of point 83. I'll need a calculator to do that one to come up with the decimal value to eight places. So if I do the square root of 0.83, that would give me 0.91104333579. Let's say the eight decimal places, 0 0.91104333. I'm just rounding to eight decimal places. Now let's compare those and put these in order from greatest to least, largest to the smallest. Well, let's look at each place value position. Well, the zero in the ones place is the same, but when we get to the tens place, we can obviously see that the nine is bigger than the three and all these other eights. So in this case, the square root of 83 I mean, the square root of 0 0.83 would be the biggest or the greatest. So that has to go first. Okay. And I know that that 0 0.383 repeating will have to be the smallest 
All right. Okay, so my concern is going to be these numbers right here. So that's first. I mean, that's the same. Now, let's look here. Well, the biggest are these two right here. The 0.883 and then the 0.8. I have to look at those more carefully when I go to the next number. This is bigger than this, so this will be 0 0.08 repeating that's next. And that will mean that point, this number right here, 0.883 with the eight and the three repeats. That's second. Okay, so these two are gone. All right, now let's look at uh, 0 0.8 and 0 0.83. Find out which one of those is bigger. Well, these are the same. Here they're different. Here this three is bigger than zero. So that means that 0 0.83 with the, only the three repeats is next. And then 0 0.8 is next. And obviously, 0 0.383 repeating is last. Okay, so that's how we order these numbers from least from greatest to least. Okay. All right, on the next page deals with radicals and rational exponents. Radicals and rational exponents. Now here, scientific calculators do have the y to the x key, which will find which we can use to find the values of expressions like four to the one half power and 3.41 to the two thirds power. Now, what does four to the one half power mean? If we extend the properties of exponents that were developed for integer exponents, it would be this. Four to the one half times four to the one half, if we multiply powers of the same base, that would mean we can bring over the base and then add the exponents. So it'd be four to the one half plus one half, which would be four to the first power. And also we can do this. Four to the one half would be this. We can square that. Since four to the one half is used as a factor twice, we can square four to the one half raised to the second power, raising the power to a power, we can multiply one half times two, half of two is one, so be four, four to the first power, which is four. Consequently, four to the one half must be a square root of four. So to obtain a unique value, it is defined to be the principal square root. That is, four to the one half power would be written as the square root of four. So in general, if X is a non-negative real number, then X to the one half is the same as the square root of X. X to the one half in radical form is gonna be the square root of X. Okay. All right, now let's look at the definition of real number raised to a rational exponent, and that's this. If X is a real number, N is a positive integer and M is an integer, then we have X to the one over N, which will be equal to the nth root of X, where the nth root of X is meaningful, okay? Okay, it has to be meaningful, where let's just say we can't take the square root of a negative number, or we can't take any even root of a negative number, that's undefined. And also X raised to the M of the N power is the same in radical form as the nth root of X to the M. And of course, N, the nth root of X to the M has to be meaningful as well. Okay. All right, now, 
Let's look at more properties on exponents. It can be shown that the properties of integer exponents also hold for rational exponents. These properties are equivalent to the corresponding properties of radicals if the expressions involving radicals are meaningful. And this is discussed more on the next page. Like this, if we let R and S be any rational numbers, X and Y be any real numbers, and N a positive integer, if all the expressions are meaningful, then part A, X to the negative power of R would be one over X to the R, okay? So for a negative exponent, we can write uh, that as one over X to the positive power. Also, X times Y raised to the R is this. We take the each uh, factor raise it to that power. So it'll be x to the r times y to the r. Everything in the parentheses will be raised to that power. And that does imply that x times y raised to the one over n would be this, x to the one over n times y to the one over n. And the nth root of x times y would be the nth root of x times the nth root of y. Now, part C is this x over y raised to the r. That means the numerator and the denominator will be raised to the power of r. So it'll be x to the r divided by y to the r. And that implies this x over y raised to the one over n, one over n will be x to the one over n divided by y to the one over n. And also the nth root of x over y is this. I can take the nth root of the numerator which is x, divided by the nth root of the denominator, which is y. And then part d would be x to the r raised to the x. I'm raising a power to a power. That means I can multiply the exponents. That would be x to the r times s, s. That's going to imply that x to the 1 over n raised to the power of p I can apply that rule of raising a power to a power. So it'd be x to the p over n, which means I have the nth root of x raised to the p, or the nth root of x to the power of p. These two are equivalently the same. And here p has to be an integer. So here the preceding properties can be used to write equivalent and simplified expressions for many roots, like for example, the square root of 96. I have to find the largest perfect square that would give me 96, and that would have to be 16. So 96 can be written as 16 times 16. And then I take the square root of 16, which is four, and just bring over the square root of six. Now, this is where this table is gonna help you out with, okay? Because 96 is not in the n squared column. I have to use the largest perfect square that gives me 96. I mean, largest factor of 96 with the perfect square in it. 16 would work. Okay, because 16 goes into 96 six times. Also, if I had the cube root of 54, this is where I use n cube and find the largest perfect cube that goes into uh, 54 has to be 27 because 27 times two gives me 54. Okay, so I write that as 27 times two underneath the cube root. Cube root of 27 would give me three and you'll be left with a cube root of two. Okay, so now we're gonna use what we talked about here with these properties to simplify these expressions here. All right, so let's say we have 16 raised to the one fourth power. And we wanna simplify this. 16 to the one fourth power. Well, 16 to the one fourth, um, Let's think about this for a moment. If I were to write that in radical form, 
that four will be the index of this radical. And the 16 will be underneath the radical. The one will be the exponent of 16. But 16 to the first is 16. Now, if I want to, I can use this table that I have here, which will be on Canvas, by the way. Look under into the fourth, since this is a fourth root, find 16. Here it is. What is the number to the fourth power that gives us 16? We look to the left. It's two. So that means that the fourth root of 16 is two. Now part B, we got 16 to the five fourth power. 16 raised to the five fourth power. Let's do this. I'm gonna write this as the denominator is four, so that's the fourth root of 16. And that five, which is my numerator, that's gonna be the exponent on the outside. I'm gonna write it like this, okay? Now, I already know what the fourth root of 16 is. We found that out in part A, that's two. And now I'm gonna do two to the fifth. So I need to find out, well, two to the fifth will be two times two times two times two times two. Pretty much if you do this on the calculator, you'll do, you'll get the answer of 32. So 16 to the five fourths power would be 32. All right, part C, negative eight to the three one third power. Negative eight to the one third power. In other words, if I write that in radical form, that would be the cube root of negative eight to the first, which is negative eight. Now we can take the cube root of a negative number. So we know it's gonna be negative. But if I wanna use that table here, I'm gonna use, look at the column that says n to the third, because n to the third and the cube root of are inverses. Let's find the number eight, here it is. What number to the third power gives me eight? Has to be two. But we got the negative, so it has to be negative two. So negative eight to the one third would be negative two. All right, part D, 125 raised to the negative four thirds power. All right, I'm gonna have to use that rule that says here if I have x raised to the negative r, I'll have to write that as one over x to the r power. So that means I'm gonna write this as one over 125 to the four thirds power. One over 125 to the four thirds power. So this will be one over, and I'm gonna write that in, in radical form as the cube root of 125, and that's going to be raised to the fourth power. Okay, so I can write it like this. Now I need the cube root of 125. Let's use this table right here under n cubed, find 125. And what number cubed gives us 125? Let's go to the left. That's going to be five. So the cube root of 125 will be five. So I have one over five to the fourth. And then if I simplify five to the fourth, that's five times five times five times five, that's gonna give me 625. So I have one over 625 as the final answer. Now part E, negative 16 to the three, to the one fourth power. Negative 16 to the one fourth power. Now, let's think about this. This will be the fourth root of negative 16. Notice that this index is even. Okay, because I can't take the uh, even root of a negative number. 
that's going to be undefined because there is no number to the fourth power that would give me negative 16. Okay. So here, this will be not a real number. Just like I can't take the square root of negative 16, that would be under five. And if you try to do that in the calculator, let's see here, if I did this and you know, I'll show you this, negative 16, and then that's gonna be raised to the one divided by four, I'm gonna get an error message, non-real answers. So negative 16 to the three, one fourth power is not gonna give you a real number. All right, let's look at this example here. Let's say we want the square root of 28 and we're gonna write that square root in the form of A times the square root of B where A and B are integers and B has the least possible value. Now, square root of 28, as you can see, is not a perfect square. Because if you look at this table of squares, you're gonna see, I mean, table of powers, I should say, you're not gonna find 28 anywhere here. What we need to do here is find the largest perfect square factor that goes into 28, all right? Well, let's not use 36, that's too big. 25 cannot go into 28 evenly. 16 can't go into 28 evenly. Nine can't go into 28 evenly, but four can go into 28 evenly. Four goes into 28 seven times. So I can write the square root of 28 as the square root of four times seven. And here I can take the square root of four and the square root is, well, I'm just put this up as square root of four times the square root of seven. Here I can take the square root of four, which will be in this case two, because two times itself gives me four and I cannot take the square root of seven. So I just bring that down. So in the form of a square root of b, I will have two square root of seven as my answer. Okay. Okay, on the next page, and this is the last page of this uh, handout. Let's say I want to write each of the following in the simplest form or as a times the nth root of b, where a and b are integers, b is greater than zero, and b has the least value possible. So let's start with part A. That's the cube root of a negative 189. Now, since our index is odd, we can take the cube root of a negative 189 and get a negative number, okay? So if we were to look at this table of powers, we're not gonna find 189 anywhere. That means we need the largest perfect cube since our index is three, we need the largest perfect cube that goes into 189 evenly. Well, I know 125 would not work. Uh, I'm not gonna use 64. Let's see, can 27 go into 189? Yes, it can, yeah. Let's use 27. 27 goes into that negative 189 seven times. So in this case here, I'm gonna have the cube root of, let's say negative 27 times seven. And in this case here, I can break this up as the cube root of negative 27 times the cube root of seven. The cube root of negative 27, well, we found 27. One number cube gives us 27, it'll be three. But since we're dealing with negative 27, it has to be negative three. 
And then, of course, we bring over the key root of seven. And that's the final answer there. Negative three times the cube root of seven. All right, part B is the fifth root of 486. The fifth root of 486. All right, so now let's go back to this table right here. Here I have up to n to the fifth in this case. So we need the largest uh, number to the fifth power or a perfect number for the to the fifth that goes into 486. Well, 243 won't work, let's try 32. I'm gonna divide 486 by 32. That two would not work. I mean, fifth root of 486. Okay, I need some help. Let's try 243, yeah. Yeah, that goes, yeah, 243 goes to the 486 two times. So let's use that, that 243 right here. Okay, so I can write this as a fifth root of 243 times two. So I break that up as the fifth root of 243 times the fifth root of two. So if I look at 243 on the end of into the fifth column, here's 243. What number to the fifth power gives me 243? Has to be three. So the fifth root of 243 is three times the fifth root of two. The fifth root of two, I can't simplify that to get a whole number from it, so I delete it as is. So the fifth root of 486 will be three raised to the three times the fifth root of two. Now part C, the cube root of 56. Cube root of 56. So I need the largest perfect cube that goes into 56 evenly. Let's see, let's try eight. Eight goes into 56 seven times. So I had the cube root of eight times seven. So let me break this up as the cube root of eight times the cube root of seven. And of course the cube root of eight going back to this table, there's eight under the n cube column. What number cube gives me eight will be two. So the cube root of eight is two times the cube root of seven. And that will be as far as I can go with that problem. And finally, part D is the fifth root of a negative 1,024. Fifth root of a negative 1,024. Well, let's go back to this uh, table. Let's go to n to the fifth, find 1,024. Here it is. 1,024 is there. Now, what number to the fifth power gives me 1,024? Has to be four. And here we're dealing with a negative, and we can take the fifth root of a negative number because that index is, is odd. So we know we're going to have a negative, and of course it was negative four. So the fifth root of negative 1,024 would be negative four. Okay. All right, here's the last example here in this video. The expression f of t is equal to seven to the 10th times 
2,401 raised to the T approximates the number of bacteria after T hours. And here's three parts to that. Part A, what is the initial number of bacteria? Bacteria That is the number when T is equal to zero. And then part B, after one fourth hour, how many bacteria are there? And part C, after half an hour, how many bacteria are there? Okay. Now, I believe with this, they just want this in exponential form. So, in part A, we'll then T equal to zero. So that means F of zero would be seven to the 10th times 240, 2,401 times t to the zero power. Yeah, I'm substituting the t with zero. Now, 2004 to the zero power, any non-zero number to a power of zero is automatically going to be one. So be seven to the 10th times one, which will be seven to the 10th. Okay, that's what they want as the final answer right here seven to the 10th power. All right, now for part B. For part B, after one fourth hour, so that means T is equal to one fourth, how many bacteria are there? So we just substitute the T in that formula with one fourth. So the F of one fourth, and that's equal to seven to the 10th times 2,401 raised to the one fourth power. Now I'm gonna write this in radical form as the fourth root of 2,401. Because 2401 to the one fourth in radical form would be the fourth root of 2401. Now I'm going to use that into the fourth, uh, this table right here. Under into the fourth, I'm going to find 2401. And here it is. So we need to find out what number to the fourth power gives us 2401. It's seven. Okay. So the fourth root of 2401 will be seven. Now, if you recall, when we multiply powers of the same base, we bring over the base and add these exponents. That seven is like seven to the one. So 10 plus one would be 11. So our final answer after one fourth hour, there are seven to the 11 bacteria left. Now part C, after one half hour, so T is gonna be one half, how many bacteria are there? So F of one half would be seven to the 10th times 2,401 raised to the one half power. Well, 2,401 to the one half power is the same as saying the square root of 2,401. So I'm bringing over the seven to the 10th times 2,401. Uh, let me use my calculator on this one because I don't think I had 2,401 on the table that I provided for you. So here, if I do the square root of 2,401, this will be 49. So I have seven to the 10th times 49. But 49, if I write, wrote that in exponential form with a base of seven, that would be seven squared. 49 is seven times seven, or seven to the second. And then when we, divide, when we multiply powers of the same base, we add the exponents here. So I bring over the base of seven, add 10 and two, you'll get 12. So after half an hour, there are seven to the 12th bacteria.
based on that uh, expression. Okay, so that does conclude this video on section 7-5, dealing with uh, real numbers. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions about any of the material that's presented in this video or any of the uh, homework problems that are in my math lab.